um, in Job 18, Bildad, the, the, the friend of Job, he kind of gives, uh, gives up, and Job says, I, I, I really thank you guys for uh, being here, but you're, you're messing me up. In Job 19, he said, Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces with your words? These ten times have you reproached me. He had ten children. You're not ashamed that you have wronged me, and if indeed I have erred, my error remains with me. If indeed you exalt yourselves against me and plead my disgrace against me, then know then that God has wronged me and has surrounded me with his net. Verse 7 uh, is, is a real warning to every one of us. If I cry out concerning wrong, am I, am I not heard? There, there's no such thing as a political right and wrong or a moral right and wrong or a church right and wrong or a family right and wrong. There is only right and there is only wrong. That today is the basic tenement uh, that is uh, stifling or, or choking our culture to death is that we can't find truth and we can't seem to find a way to hang on to truth. And so Job says, listen, if I'm, I'm crying out here concerning wrong, I'm, I am not heard. If I cry aloud, there is no justice. And so we are hearing the word over and over again about social justice. We hear it now from leaders. We hear it from um, city leaders that have moved the pendulum as it, as it shifts now to a um, more of a social, um, socialist agenda of uh, we, we just have to do away with everything that speaks. For instance, I heard a congressman a congresswoman say yesterday, if you're against this bill, whatever the bill was, they were. if you're against this bill, you are a racist. These are, are words that our national leaders are throwing out daily and have literally diminished the value of the word completely. And so Job looks at these three guys and said, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to tell you, if, if I scream out about wrong, you're going to come after me. If I scream about, it, about what is right, wrong, or justice, uh, am I not going to be heard? And then the fall apart verse where, where your Bible opens up. And here it is with mine in verse 23. And if you ever yellow in your Bible, I, I have that in mind because it's one of those, it just opens naturally. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. Now, what are we talking about? Words. The words that I've spoken. I wish they were inscribed in a book. I wish they were engraved in a rock. I wish they were the iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. At the weakest moment in your life, the weakest point, the most dramatic moment in your life, you need to know that somewhere there is written in stone, in the book, engraved in a rock, and lead forever. I know that my Redeemer lives. So that's why it's a, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful unwritten note to every one of us. And I wish that these words can. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that is, in my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And so I stop right there to say, that e even in the worst dramatic moment of your life, there is always the knowledge. Now, is that there with you? The knowledge of who I am with Jesus Christ as my Savior, who I am uh, as uh, a born-again believer, who I am as a, as a husband, a father, a grandfather, who I am as a minister of the gospel, who you are in, in local business. I am still, uh, as Brother Betty said, we had a, a great celebration of life. I'm still... My head is just uh, circling about uh, what I saw a couple of days ago. I mean, I, I don't have it all processed yet. Um, and I think that, uh, not, in, not, not in disbelief, nothing like that. Um, I'm just saying influence and legacy, uh, integrity, sometimes has a small value in this life. But don't ever doubt. When you in yours, if it's there, it will rise to the top, and uh, it will come to the top. Now, now let's go to First Kings fifteen. The 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 fatal flaw of fame. First, uh, what did I say? Well, that's what I'm. That's what we need to do, of course. 
1 Samuel 15. Well, I'm talking about King, King Saul, and you can see what happened there. Hey, good news for you ladies. Sunday Sermon, Men, Part 2. You got to admit, we, there's just a lot of material. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of material. Now the word of the Lord, verse ten. Saul has been; he he has uh, become king, and we can go back through the the earlier chapters, and uh, but now uh, there's a change of heart. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, "I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king." Let me stop and ask you a question. When God says, I'm sorry, how do you deal with that? When God says, I'm sorry, how do we deal with that? And what does it mean? How can a sovereign God be sorry for anything? Because if he's, if he's sovereign, then surely he knew uh, before anything happened that it would happen. But would, would you not agree with that? Isn't that what sovereignty means? If we are saved by a sovereign grace of God, then wouldn't he know? Of course he would know. So, uh, what does it mean for God to be sorry? He said it another place. Anybody else remember another point? Uh, I, I am sorry. Yeah, exactly. Right before the flood. And uh, I regret. Uh, there's a word. It's a big old Greek word, anthropomorphism. And it simply means attempting to communicate. Like, uh, how many of you talk to your dogs? You talk to your dog. Yeah, sweet. Huh? Don't have a dog? <laughs> Well, don't be talking to yours in. You know, that's a little weird. <laughs> that's even worse if you talk to the invisible dog, Judy. All right, that's anthropomorphism, which simply means attempting to communicate to, to someone other than human flesh. In fact, it's a, they've made a religion out of that. Uh, but this is God uh, explaining to man in man's own terms of that emotion. Does God regret anything? Apparently so. Does God have feelings? Yes, apparently so. Uh, now the word of the Lord came. I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. But it sounds to us when we write a language, and this King, king Jim language, is, it's like God looked at it and said, oh man, I messed up there. I, I didn't see that coming. That's not true at all. But he is explaining to uh, Samuel. And why to Samuel? Because Samuel was the person charged with one thing. What? Go to go anoint him. This is your job. So he did what he was told to do. So let's read a little bit further because um, uh, fame's uh, fatal flaw um, is, is what can destroy every one of us. And it's not just for famous people, but uh, having this fatal flaw of fame is what's going to, to destroy the king and then it destroys the nation. You begin to see the analogy by which I'm, I'm referring to. And every nation that has ever been set up more than 210 nations that we have now, it doesn't matter. Examine the leadership, look at the king or whatever theocracy they have or monarchy or whatever they have. Examine it. Uh, as goes leadership, so goes the nation. So the word of the Lord, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned, um, he's turned back from following me and has not performed, performed my commandments. So when God is sorry, there's two things that are happening. The first is this, uh, he turned back, he stopped following. There was a point in Saul's life uh, that he was. He was following. All leadership must be able to submit itself somewhere. You, you just can't rebel here. There's got to be someone. When, when you consider yourself um, like a child who says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Now that's the most immature statement that a human being can make. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm a, I'm, I don't want to work for anybody else. I want to work for myself because I, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. And so uh, that's a, the, the opening frame of all rebellion is, I don't believe it. You, if you don't believe that, let's go back to Genesis again. What was the open rebellion of mankind? What was the, what's, what's Satan's first word in the Bible? What does he say? First sentence. Help me out. What's Satan's first sentence in the Bible? Uh, is that exactly. Uh, well, that's the second one. The first one was, though, uh, but you win the prize. You, you get the prize. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, hath God said? Question mark. Satan's open line in the Bible is a question. 
questioning God. See, God doesn't mean you're going to die. What God means here is that. And so the, the first form of all rebellion is to not submit. And, and that's, that's exactly what we all do at points in time. A marriage is a, is a committal of submission. That's all in the world it is. And when people say, or dogs, cats, or ponies say, I'm not submitting, no one tells me what to do, I'm going to do whatever I want, uh, then you're going to fall into the same trap that the uh, fame's fatal flaw is, which is, one, you got to stop. You have to stop the flow. Uh, he just turned back. I'm not going to do this anymore. Two, uh, he stopped performing. And I love the word here. He stopped performing, which is actively doing commandments. You see, you, Jesus wrapped it all up when the Pharisees and Sadducees continued to try to trip him up. He wrapped it all up. And then, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. Wait. He finally said, hey, guys, let me, let me encapsulate this for you. Love God, keep the commandments. You got that? Is that too hard for you? Love God, keep the commandments. The basis of all Christianity is what? Love God, keep the commandments. What's the chief commandment? Love one another. Love God, love one another. And so he said, uh, these two things. When God is sorry, uh, he, he, he hates to see this in us. So rebellion or turning back uh, from uh, following in faith. It's a stoppage of faith. And then stop performing the, the obedience to the commands. There is an obedience clause for even for believers. And I, I think... The worst disgrace of grace is for us to say as believers, we can do anything we want to do. That's not true. Where did you get that? Oh, we're under grace, man. I can do anything I want to do because God's going to forgive me. You're in a disgrace. That is not the grace of God. That is a disgrace. In fact, what's what Paul said uh, uh, to, to the Corinthian people? <laughs> you folks are living in disgrace, um, denying all this. So when God is sorry, here's what happens. What makes God sorry? The uh, turning back from believing, stop performing the obedience. You're, you're in the same quality that he is. You're under the same law, same commandment that he is. Uh, there, there are commandments and we're to keep them. Yeah, but wait a minute. If, if we have to keep a commandment, that that's not grace. Uh, the, the commandments that we've been called to keep is re to remind ourselves that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these commandments. So you love Jesus, put Jesus first. Okay, now... Um, when Samuel sees the sheep, let's read a little bit first, verse 12. So when Samuel rose up early in the morning to meet Saul, um, after crying out to the Lord all night, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed, now help me out. Who can remember anything about Carmel? Anything big time about Carmel or caramel or craft caramel? <laughs> Anybody remember anything about caramel? Say it again. El El Elijah. Yeah, right. What happened, on the, what happened on the mount? Anybody remember? So why are you asking all these questions? What is up with that? Say it again. Calling down the fire. The prophets of Baal, they, they, they bring and they, they, they speak and, and uh, attempt. They cut themselves trying to call fire down and then he puts water pot after water pot after water pot and the fire of the Lord falls. And whew, there we go. Uh, so Saul went to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself. What just happened? Uh, what's wrong with this sentence? What's the matter with this? What is wrong? He, he went to Carmel which is already an outstanding place. What happened here? He set up a monument to himself. Hey, we're right back. This is Babylon stuff. This is the, four, the, the head, the brass, the, the feet, the lead, iron, and then the lead feet. The fatal flaw of fame is the thought that everyone else feels about you like you feel about you. You built a monument to yourself? And this is, this is what happened. When Samuel sees sheep, he, he, he sees the sheep, and he, sat and he built a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Now, Samuel's after the king. He can't catch up to him. He's trying to catch up to him to deliver the message. Verse 13, Samuel went to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now, this is what... 
Saul says to him, I have performed the commandment. What do we say in verse 11? He has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Uh, Christianity is, in today's culture, is under attack. Uh, it's under attack because we're the only thing left that is absolutely controlled by faith. I mean, if, if it's, it's all that's left. You show me one other entity, show me one other organization that is led by, by groups and leaders who say, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We're not in charge of that. We live by faith. That's up to the Lord. There's nothing else on the planet like this. Why are you Christians? Don't you know that we're in a pandemic? Why do you continue to give your money and, and, and invest it in the kingdom's work? Don't you understand we're in, these are tough times. You need to hold back for yourself first. We're the only group in the world that says, no, you honor the Lord. You honor the Lord. Doesn't matter what time it is, how tough it is. You honor the Lord first in, with, with everything that you have. So he says, hey, Samuel, good to see you. I have performed the commandments. The fatal flaw of fame is that you begin to believe that your words are immortal. Not God's, but your words. That's why they can say things that, seriously, you expect us to believe this? You actually think we're that stupid to believe this? And so their words in their own mind become immortal. That's why they can literally say anything. Now, who are, you say, they, who are you talking about? Anybody that takes a role of leadership. Anyone. Um, if I walked up here tonight and sat here on this stool and said, Listen, God spoke to me last night. And, and, and when, as God spoke to me, He told me that you, Ken, and uh, you, Miss D, God spoke to me and told me that y'all are going to give $10,000 tomorrow to the work. So, okay. And then I move on. Okay. Okay. Now, they're, they've lost me, right? I mean, from that point on, it is. Why didn't God say anything to me about that? So you see, when, when anyone comes to you and says, God told me to tell you this, it's, it's already under suspect with me. I have said thousands of times, I'm, I believe I'm led by the Spirit to say this. And I, and I think that is legitimate. But when we begin to tell other people that our word is God, that our word is God, that what I'm saying to you has come from God. I think we have reached a hierarchical position that, that is a fatal flaw of fame. Uh, and if you watch Christian television at all, and I don't want to, I mean, I don't mean to be offensive about this, but this prosperity gospel, that's where, it, that's where it comes from. It starts with a, if you'll sow this seed, sow this seed and then to me, send this, send, send this to me, and then I, and that's where it all comes from. But anyway, the fatal flaw of fame is that I have kept the commandments and expect people to believe it by my word only. That's what pride does. It literally blinds us to reality of truth. And so uh, Samuel verse 14 says, what then is the meaning of the bleeding of the sheep in my ears? He said, well, what was the commandment to do? And it wasn't one of the Ten Commandments written on the stone. This was an active word of God that came from the prophet of God that said what? Destroy the Amalekites, everything they possess. Destroy it. And that's why leaders, and I'm talking political leaders, I'm talking about world leaders, I'm talking about Christian leaders who literally could say anything that they want and expect people to believe that. And that's the sad thing about it being in the religious world is it's a double whammy because uh, they're taking advantage not only of believers but of the kingdom, of the church, lying about God uh, and, and lying about their ability to talk to God and God's word is me, therefore you need to hear me. Uh, and what do you do with the conversation that someone says, God told me to tell you this? And I tell you without fail, now I'll be respectful and meaning for you, but I've already discounted, I mean, I don't, you can tell me whatever you want to tell me, but if, if the Holy Spirit rebels of that, what they say in my heart, just move on. Just move on. It's, it's a lie and, and don't worry about it, just, but leave it alone. Samuel said, what then meaneth the bleeding of the sheep? When Samuel hears the sheep, he's saying, you're lying, because every bleed of the sheep says, liar, liar, liar. <laughs> Pants on fire, fire, fire. 
liar. You, you, uh, your words have no credibility. And even when you scream, this is the king of a nation who screams out, oh yes, I'm doing everything that, uh, that I'm supposed to be doing. Then what meaneth the bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Uh, verse 15. This is politically called walking it back. You see that on television? Uh, President so-and-so, Congressman so-and-so, Congresswoman so-and-so had to walk this back today. Verse 15, walk it back. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So I'm not doing what, you, what the Lord gave us in a commandment to do, because we're going to honor the Lord with what we're going to do. When your hand is caught in the cookie jar, uh, you have to come up with a holistic reasoning of why you're caught. This is why I'm caught. It's for your own good. We are doing this for you. I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> Let's walk that back. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel, and did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now be quiet. You be quiet. Tell me the key, key word in this, the key phrase. When you were little in your mind. You can circle that. This is the source of all humility when you're little in your own mind. This is the source of humility. When God is sorry, it's because we do these two things. We turn back, we stop believing, and we stop doing the things that we know are right. When, Sam, when Samuel sees the sheep, he immediately uh, corners him and tells him the difference that he sees. You were already over all the tribes. Saul was a great soldier. Saul was a great leader. Saul was a great strategist. Saul won many battles. Uh, but when you were little in your own eyes, God anointed you over Israel. Verse 18, now the Lord sent you on a mission. So uh, when you were little, you were humble. Always remember that about any, any, any praise. The, the last line of the movie with George C. Scott and Patton. Anybody see that movie, Patton? It's a mystical movie, uh, but it is historically accurate. But in the last frame, Patton goes out there and he's wherever he is. I don't remember if he's in, back in North Africa or where. And he tells the story about the conquering king. And he's over, the, tri over the, the triumph where the king would come into the city. And he said when a king would conquer a country, they would bring all the unusual animals and they would parade them through in front of him. And then the, they would bring the kings and the leaders and they would parade them. In, and then here was the king in his chariot. And of course, the thousands would throwing the uh, flowers and the palms in front of him. But in the chariot with the king was a servant that was saying a line. Does anybody remember what the line of that that he's saying? Uh, fame is fleeting. He's reminding the king even when the accolades are coming, that this is fleeting. The problem with kings, the problem with presidents, past presidents, congressmen, is that they get addicted to the accolade. That way their words then become immortal. Their words become all-powerful. That's why former presidents never go away. I will give kudos to President Jimmy Carter. I don't think any president in modern history has just gone and picked up his carpenter's bag, got him a nail gun, and just went to work building people's homes for, uh, for, and he's like 95 years old, and he fell off the roof the other day or something, he said he may have to quit on that, you know, but uh, the reason they don't, they don't go away, they become addicted to the accolade. Uh, when you're addicted, then that, the, the fatal flaw of fame is the reality that I'm bigger than I am. I am really bigger than I am. Have you ever met a real big shot? you ever met a big-time musician or a big-time anything? You know, it's like the air that's around them and the people that have your back, don't you know, and all this that goes on. And the same with public. You know, they get addicted to that. They get addicted to living higher than anyone else. Uh, or you'll stop at a little dive on the side of the road and you'll see a picture of Johnny Cash 
They signed it, who ate with them there and immortalized that spot that Johnny Cash ate. Why, why do we do that? We can't help it. We're, 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 we're in love with the idea of fame. We really are. And when, when I see kids uh, give hundreds of dollars away to go see Lady Gaga, it just, it just does something to me. I mean, I wouldn't go watch her if she was playing in my backyard, uh, you know, but I wouldn't for most, most performers anyway. But what I'm saying to you is they get hooked on that. And if you don't think that that's not a drug, if that's, uh, that, then you're wrong. And this is what happened to, to uh, Saul. So um, the last framing of, of uh, Saul's condition in verse uh, 15, what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep? Well, this is for everybody's good. We're going to go and sacrifice. Uh, verse 18, Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, Now he's still walking it back, uh, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I did go on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agog, the king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took off the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Okay. The fatal flaw of fame, number two, it's not just when you are no longer little in your own mind. It is when... In verse 21, it's when you blame everything that's gone wrong on everybody else. And that's what's wrong with the American political system. Uh, that's what's wrong with uh, governments, not just ours, it's everybody. Is that, does anybody ever stand up and say, this was my fault, I, I was wrong here. And so uh, Samuel says, verse 22, look at their pie. And this is in yellow in my Bible because it is, it is uh, uh, relevant in every issue of your life. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Now, comparison statement. It, okay, is the Lord like your sacrifices as much as He likes obedience? Behold, and this is the answer. Behold, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. There's no doubt. You'd be better off if you're just obedient than to, to give what you took and still give a part of it back. Many years ago, uh, when we lived in Stillwell, Oklahoma, we were at First Baptist Stillwell, there was a man in our town, he's a very successful businessman, and he went to the Methodist church. And uh, one day I saw him in town. I called him Mr. B. I said, hey, Mr. B, how are you doing? He said, I'm really good. I need you to pray for me next week. I said, what's next week? He said, well, I'll be flying to Vegas. And uh, every year, one of the big casinos, they have this one tournament. They, they invite 100 people from across the United States who have to put up $100,000 to get in the game. And he's, he was one of the 10. He said, pray for me because if I, if I win, if I win the pot, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give my tithe on it. But he was a Methodist, so I didn't know whether to pray or not. Uh, you know, well, I mean, it was in our church. so He goes out there. And it's in the Tulsa, uh, the Tulsa World newspaper. Pick it up four days later. Bam. Guess who won? Mr. B. He won the pot. He came back. The Methodist Church got an entire new parking lot. Got this, got this, got this, got this, got this. Um, I always think about that story. Was like, why couldn't he have been a Baptist? <laughs> why do the Methodists get the word? But here's the thing. He said, I will tithe. I, I will tithe on this. Does God honor and bless? I don't know. I don't know whether it does or not. But here's the, here's the thing. Uh, well, God can use any money God from any source. I'm not saying that. So it's still better to obey than it is to sacrifice. Always remember that. This is the answer of all answers about any moral, ethical question. Wait a minute. Uh, well, if I do this, um, no. Is this right or is it wrong? It's better to obey than it is to sacrifice. You know when your kids do wrong and they explain it to you in, in a way that, but I did some good things here for you, it, it's hard not to give them credit for it, but it, it's still better. It's always better to obey than it is to sacrifice. And to heed than the fat of all the rams. 
For rebellion is as the sin of, help me out, what's the next word? Witchcraft. There, so, from the Garden of Eden, the first doubt of sin that came from mankind's lips is as witchcraft. Now, why is that? What's the deal about witchcraft? For rebellion is as the sin of which. So Saul, everything that you're doing, and, and, and even in the presenting of the sacrifice to God, it's false. Witchcraft is false. Witchcraft is built on a premise that Satan is, is the king of the universe. So everything that we do that is not blessed of God, and that is not by faith, and that is not submitted to God, is the same as witchcraft. And so rebellion, the first act of rebellion in the Bible to the last act of rebellion in the Bible is as witchcraft. And stubbornness is as inquiry and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. And that's the whole deal. And we put an amen to it right. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. Saul, you are in this mess because the two things, when God is sorry, it's when he, when he sees us when we turn our back. He sees us when we stop doing the things that we know are right. How many believers are in this county that no longer, that no longer practice this Christianity? I mean, they have a head knowledge of it. They know Jesus. The shed blood of Christ saves us. They know what that, and, and they're probably saved. But they do not practice anything else. They do not worry or work on forgiving others. They do not worry or work on, on confessing their own sin. They do not worry or work on looking at other people who need help and say, the Lord has called us as a church to help others. They do not actively practice that. And so he says, because of that, uh, you reject the word of the Lord. What is the unforgivable sin? It's only mentioned one time. When you blaspheme the Holy Spirit or what? Give credit, um, give allegiance or credit, not to the Lord, but to Satan. So uh, our presidents, congressmen and women and senators all of these unelected officials that are running all of these, all of these things that keep a nation going. Um, do you think they're involved in this? Oh yeah, for sure. I'm not saying they're practicing witchcraft. It is as the, it's the same thing. It's false. And I'm not saying the last administration didn't have a whole bunch of the same thing. But what I'm saying to you today is the Word of God has been so diminished that no longer do we feel like we will be in trouble if we just stop practicing it, if we stop believing it, it's okay. And you can say what you want. You can walk anything back, but you can't unring a bell, can you? You, you can't unring a bell. And it's like there, there, are, there are two uh, components of forgiveness. And when, when we examine the components of being forgiven and forgiving others, um, there are two components, for, forgiving, forgetting, forgiving, forgetting, forgiving. And all of you have said it. I promise you, you've said it or thought it. All right, I may forgive you, but by golly, I ain't ever going to forget what you've done. Now, I'm guilty. How about y'all? I ain't ever going to forget it. No one's asking you to. No one's asking you to. Because that's not, that's not the, the principle of forgiveness is not so that we can instantly somehow wipe out what was done to us, that made us a victim of someone else's pride or arrogance or, or whatever. But that component of forgiveness means, hmm, it doesn't really matter if I forget it or not. That's not the issue. The issue is, are you going to forgive? Which is releasing the other person. Releasing that other person. And if you can't do that, then you can't practice the one thing that he says that makes us different from the whole world, which is what? Forgiveness. I am willing to forgive you for what you've done. A good marriage is made up of two pretty good forgivers. Al, you need to remember that when you get married Saturday. A marriage is made up of two pretty good forgivers. Father, thank you so much for a beautiful day to serve you. Thank you so much for the good number of folks that have come out. We pray that we've encouraged them. Uh, Lord, we know that you're sovereign, but sometimes you're still sorry for what you see in our lives. I pray that you'll help us uh, to, to see the warnings of the fatal flaw of all fame is that it's fleeting, is that it takes the place of, of genuine heart brokenness over our condition. I pray that you help us in Jesus' name.